Hello everyone, this is jo I am Josh Friedel for ChessLecture.com and today I'll be going over uh, the Yugoslav attack uh, as well as showing a pretty interesting rook ending which comes at the end of the game. So I'll be going over a game I played recently at uh, the East Bay Fide Swiss, um, it was a 10 round norm tournament and I actually missed my last GM norm by half a point, so a bit disappointing but I did play a few nice games and this was one of them. Uh, so, one of the reasons I'm showing this is because uh, not only was it a fairly nice game, but also uh, in the last game, if you recall my first lecture, it was also Yugoslav where I beat uh, I am Mizensev. And that was a very nice rook, it had a nice rook sacrifice, exact actually a couple things, and then, you know, I got a nice maining attack, um, you know, so it was a really nice sacrificial game which is often how you'll win in the Yugoslav. However, things, you know, that's the ideal, but things don't always work out like you plan. And which means that sometimes you actually have to grind out an ending. And it doesn't mean you've necessarily done something wrong. I mean, it's said that the Yugoslav gets mated by force, uh, by some at least, but sometimes, you know, you can't win like that. If your opponent really is big on not getting mated, then oftentimes you'll have to grind out an ending, which is what I had to do. So, uh, starting moves, e4, c5, knight f3, knight c6. So I've been experimenting with a bunch of lines here now. Uh, but knight c3 is the move I've been playing for a while, and I decided to use it this game because it tends to be pretty double-edged, and I knew he'd go into a dragon, uh, which, you know, we both really had to... W he actually had to draw, I had to win. Um, so a dragon was perfectly fine with me, although I know that Danny plays these positions very well. Um... I still thought, you know, it was my, one of my best chances to try to win. So I play knight c3 here. Um, I'm showing you a different move order. This ends up being a Yugoslav attack. However, it starts off a little bit differently. The reason why I'm showing this is because in the mainline Yugoslav, I'll go back a couple moves, black plays d6, d4, cd, knight takes d4, knight f6, knight c3, g6, bishop e3, bishop g7, f3, knight c6 or castles, both pretty much transposed, queen d2, knight c6, and now this line ca nine castles long has been really just destroying the Yugoslav. Almost nobody plays this as black now. Now black has a couple main moves. This is certainly playable. Black can either take on d4 and play bishop e6, after which king b1 is an important move. It prevents queen a5 because it runs into knight d5, and then the e7 pawn goes, unless the queen goes back, in which case you double the f-pawns, which is really good for white. So black will play queen c7, h4, rook fc8, and now either g4 and h5, or h5 immediately I think is considered better. And life goes on, but it's, I think it's considered pretty good for white these days, especially the immediate h5 line. The other way black can play is with d5, and now there are lots of moves. There's the rarer moves, king b1, queen e1. Uh, Queen e1, I think, is Shabalov's move, although he's also played king b1. Uh, and there, you know, white's doing fairly well there. And also the main line, which is ed, knight d5, knight c6, bc6. And now, uh, white either usually plays bishop d4. Knight takes d5, grabbing a pawn, black scores fairly well. So usually white would play bishop d4. Black now, the main line is e5. However, uh, sometimes black will go for a sideline. For example, bishop takes d4, queen takes d4, queen b6, after which knight a4 is the best move, trying to gain control of the c5 square. There's also the sideline, knight c3, queen c3, bishop h6 check. And now king b1 loses to e5 in this nasty pin on the d-file. Don't fall into that, folks. So bishop e3. Bishop takes e3, queen takes e3, queen b6, and now usually white grabs the e-pawn and hides, goes back to a3 to support b2. And this is a little bit tricky, but white's usually scored pretty well here also. Um, and finally there's e5, after which white plays bishop c5, black plays bishop e6. Now the key thing to remember in these positions is not to be in a hurry to take material. Oftentimes the way black does well in these positions is if white grabs a rook, or sometimes even two, and then the minor pieces just come at him. The key is uh, that this bishop doesn't, you know, reign on this diagonal. And often black will put the rook here, and those can be very dangerous. The key is to keep control of black's play. You play knight e4, 
It's the best move. Now either rook e8 or rook b8. Rook b8, I think, is considered a little bit better. And now there are lots of options. There's h4, g4, bishop c4 to b3 I kind of like. It's a blocking the b-pawn. And the key is basically you restrict black's play. Is the real way to play this position. And again, there's lots of theory here, which you have to know. I'm not going to get into too much of it right now. Uh, but basically, those are the ideas that you usually play. So that's the mainline Yugoslav. However, I haven't had almost any games in that, because this is just considered bad for black these days. So, the way more people are doing it is with not a, you, um, sorry, a transposition from the accelerated dragon. So if knight c3 or d4, either way, I played knight c3 in this game, g6. So now d4, c takes d4, knight takes d4, bishop g7, bishop e3, knight f6, bishop c4, castles. Now bishop b3 is necessary. If you play f3, it runs into queen b6. And this is, this is a line, however, black's doing pretty well here. For example, if queen d2, knight takes e4 is a nasty move. The idea is that you hit the knight on d4 and the queen. And it's actually playable for white. It's just certainly no advantage. Uh, and if castles, then knight takes e4 followed by d5 is considered fine for black. So bishop b3 is best. And now uh, black can play a5 or queen a5 trying to force castles kingside. Uh, however, you can play d6 uh, and f3. And now you're in a, sort of like a Yugoslav. However, there are slight differences. Um... So here, he plays bishop d7, which is what most people play. And now there are a couple moves, queen d2 and h4. Queen d2 is a bit more common. However, after knight d4, bishop d4, b5, uh, black tends to do, you know, reasonably, I think. It's not so clear how white takes advantage of this. So I think the slightly better move is actually h4. The idea being now knight takes d4, bishop takes d4, b5 is not so great because h5 and white's up a tempo because oftentimes black will trade on d4 and you haven't wasted a move with queen d2 and this is just very good for white I mean one tempo as you know anyone who plays the Yugoslav for either color one tempo can be the difference between mating and getting mated very very common so um, after h4 uh, most people play h5 that's what Kudrin played against me and we had a very interesting game which I ended up winning and rook c8 is possible. However, um, Danny played knight a5. Now, those of you who saw my other lecture will be going, hey, that's what Mazensev played. Oh, my gosh. Um, so I was a little bit startled that why he'd won a repeated game, which I won very nicely. <laughs> However, I knew he had an improvement somewhere. So after knight a5, I played queen b d2. Fairly natural. h5 this early is probably not going to work out well. Um... But black's played a weird move knight a5, so I'm certainly not, you know, I don't have to worry now about knight d4 and b5. So queen d2 makes a lot of sense. And instead of playing rook c8 like Mazensev played, which I think was a slight mistake, because then he sort of, he transposed into a Yugoslav where I've already had h4, h5 in. So an even worse version of the main line, which has, you know, done pretty well for white lately. So after queen d2, he took on b3. Now, this is a situation that will often come up in the Yugoslav. Not that often. I mean, knight a5 lines are a bit more rare. But when it happens, it's really key that you know how to take back if black takes on b3. A takes b3 is what common sense would tell you. Oh, you open, you know, you open the a file for your rook. Um, and, you know, take towards the center. All normal. However, you have to remember, with h4 in, you're not castling kingside. If you're not committed to castling kingside, you can think about taking with a pawn. Or, sorry, not committed to castling queenside. However, uh, if you are, then you really do not want to take with a pawn. Because if you castle and the queen comes to a5, or a black plays a5, a4, you could have some problems. Uh, you do not want an open a file when you're castled queenside. Some common sense for you. <laughs> so... Knight takes b3 is sometimes played, the idea being to get the knight out of the way to play, do something on the d file. The problem is then a5, a4 again can be very, very annoying, and your knight's a little bit out of play on b3. Oftentimes the knight wants to either come back to e2 and maybe go to f4, g3 to support h5, or sometimes even sack itself on f5. It's very, very rare it wants to go to b3, unless black plays the queen out there first. 
So uh, usually, and I'm not saying this is true all the time. There's, in chess, there's almost nothing true all the time. But in these types of positions, c takes b3 is usually the best way to go, which is what I played. The pawn structure in the dragon usually favors black. Um, it's just one of those things. Black's pawn structure is very nice. Endings tend to be very nice. Not always, which you'll see. Uh, however, the nice thing about c takes b3, it looks ugly, but now for black to try to do a pawn storm on the king side is much harder because white has an extra pawn over there. So white can trade a pair of pawns and not just have it to deal with an open file because there are still a, an a and b pawn left. So white has a whole extra pawn to defend his king with. The open c file looks nasty, but after castles, white's going to play king b1 rather quickly, and then that c file will be pretty much irrelevant. So c takes b3 is almost always the way to go in these situations, uh, which I, I used to take the other ways too. So <laughs> believe me, I know the mistake. So he played rook e8, which is a little bit suspicious to me. It's a nice looking move as in, you know, in the dragon. It's fairly common. You occasionally want to play e5, d5. But more importantly, after bishop h6, you want to play bishop h8 to keep your nice dragon bishop. However, this moves often very slow. And this allows me to really get off an attack. So after rook e8, I castle queenside. He plays queen a5. So now I really want to get my king off the c file. And I want to be able to move my c knight in, on some occasions. So I play king b1. Very natural. And he plays rook a c8. So now, this is always a tough choice. Typically, h5 is like an auto move here. But I was thinking about this, and oftentimes black may want to sack on c3. And, or play b5. And if I sack a pawn, it's much more likely black will be able to sack a pawn or an exchange. So in this position, I decided on g4. The idea being, I haven't sacked anything. So if he's going to play a b5 move, I might just be able to grab that pawn. And the endings, which are usually good for black, are not necessarily if you're just down a pawn. Now, there are some exceptions, obviously. But anyway, I would play on this move also because sometimes um, if, white, if black decides to play e5, for example, I can simply play my knight back. And now g5 and knight d5 is really annoying to have to deal with. So anyway, um, so g4 really leaves him without a lot of useful moves. Here he told me after the game he realized he was just in serious danger. So he plays what he has to do. He plays b5. So now I take on b5, which is certainly not a mistake. However, I could probably just get a good attack with h5. And this is a really nice attack. Um, however, black has counterplay. He gets in b4. Okay, I have to move. And then maybe an e5, d5 type push. And, you know, it's certainly fine for white, but it's certainly counterplay. So this is one of those situations in the Yugoslav. Oftentimes, endings are good for black because the nice pawn structure, nice pieces, and without getting mated, there's certainly, you know, nothing positionally wrong with it. So it's very often that endings are good for black. However, there are always exceptions. And here, uh, I calculated sort of a long sequence, somewhat incorrectly as it turned out. But um, that ends up in an ending which is just really good for white. So I played knight c takes b5. So this breaks sort of the old school rules of the Yugoslav. Oh, you never go into endings as white because they're always good for black. You've got a mate. But it, in reality, this is not always the case. So I play take on b5. He takes on d2, which is pretty forced. Rook takes d2, e5. This was his idea. Otherwise, he's simply down a pawn. So now he's attacking my knight. Uh, both knights, as a matter of fact. Knights defending each other uh, are usually not as good. They don't usually work together very well. Um, and this is sort of a nice illustration of it. However, I plan knight takes d6. So I had an idea. So I'm going to sack a piece temporarily, but I'm forking these two pieces. He takes on d4. And here, I play a mistake. I sort of recaptured automatically, thinking that, you know, I'm forking his two rooks, and, you know, there's not much he can do about it. But this was a really serious error. What I should have done is play knight takes e8. So now, if he takes on e3, I simply can play knight takes f6 check, bishop takes, and rook takes d7. And he's just down the exchange for not really enough compensation. Um, 
you know, I'm just going to surround, win the e-pawn, and then I'm just going to be up tons of material. So he'd have to recapture, um, either with the rook or bishop, most likely with the bishop, so that he doesn't have to worry about it hanging. And then bishop takes d4. And this ending is just going to be torture for black. I have three pawns for a bishop and a rook for a bishop and knight. Now, you may know that, you know, bishop and knight are as good as rook and pawn better, usually. Often as good as rook and two pawns, although it depends. But rook and three pawns, even if they're doubled, it's just too much. And with my other rook coming into play, his pieces having no good squares, this would just be a great ending for me. So, uh, however, I played bishop takes d4. Uh, so I got a little careless for one move, and now I have a really tough task on my hands. He instantly played bishop takes g4 and offered a draw. And I realized what I missed. I missed that after uh, fg knight e4, all of a sudden like my rook and knight are forked. I don't have time to take his rook. I thought I could take his rook on e8, I think, was the idea. Um, but it doesn't really work out so well. So now I'm going to have to grind out a very tough rook ending. So again, this happens. So I play bishop takes f6. Bishop takes f3, forced. If he had taken my bishop, I take his rook, attacking the bishop. Rook takes knight, pawn takes bishop. Followed by g5 is a really nice ending for white. Pretty much winning. So he has to take on f3. And I think what I missed is that after rook f1, bishop takes e4 is check. Again, after a game and you miscalculate, it happens. It's hard to figure out exactly what you miscalculated. But um, in this case, it's, uh, I think it was that I missed this was check, or I missed, like, it was defended, or that I wasn't on material. In any case, I missed something. So in the, in the dragon, miscalculating is really unforgivable. It's, in most situations, it's, like, you know, it can be fatal for either side. Uh, however, in this particular situation, my position was so good that I end up in a rook ending, which, although it looks at first like it should be nothing, and my opponent thought it was too, uh, it's actually still good for me, but it's very, very tough. So after bishop takes e4, knight takes e4, rook takes e4, bishop takes g7, king takes g7, I play rook d7, pretty obvious. So let's pause here. So we've gone from me trying to mate him on the king side, him trying to stir up something in the center on the queen side, to a rook ending. <laughs> this is one of the hardest things to adjust to in all of chess. I mean... You go from a position where you're hacking away at each other to a position, you know, a very subtle ending, which can often end up at a pawn race, which ends up crazy, but at the same time, it's completely different. Most players have serious problems transitioning, and it's not uncommon for blunders to take place in these types of positions. Now, I don't think my opponent necessarily blundered here, but he certainly overestimated his position. He thought he had absolutely nothing to worry about here, that he could get the draw pretty easily. And for him, that would mean an I am norm. I had to win twice for a GM norm. So I was a little bit nervous that I ended up in a rook ending when I wanted an attack. But at the same time, it's very, you know, it's certainly capable, it's certainly doable to win a rook ending as well as win an attack. And even in an opening such as the Yugoslav, you'll have to do it occasionally. If you recall, in the Mazentsev game, there was this one variation where I'd have to grind out a pawn up ending. You know, it just happens. And oftentimes that's how you got to win. You can't, you know, have your dream combination. It's very rare. It happened to me that, that time. Uh, but in most of my other dragon games, it's not happened. So, Anyway, so you have to be prepared for a, tr tr a transition of positions. One of the, you know, the hardest things. Um, so I lost a good deal of my advantage, unfortunately. But I still have a little bit. And um, it's a very interesting endgame. But I was able to use it to win. So I play rook d7. He plays king h6, which is a clever move. Um, if he takes on h4... I take on f7, he has to play back, and, which is already bad. Usually the key, you want an active king in an ending. Having a passive king like this is very bad. So I'd love to take on, H, on um, a7, but there's rook h1 mate. So instead, I'd play a4, give my king some shelter. Um, and this, en this position should probably favor white, because his king is very passive, and mine actually has a future. Uh, the tripled pawns although they look really bad, are actually very good in a, in a double rook ending in particular, because the pawns help shield the king. With one ro single rook ending, shelter is a little bit important, but in double rook endings, it's really important. If your king does not have a, 
place that's safe from checks, often you're, you know, unless you're up a lot of material, it's often, you know, you can't really do much. So it's key to have a shelter, and these bee ponds act as basically a shield for my king. So that was one of the reasons why I actually thought this was good for me. Even though he'd have the three pawns, like, separated, and I have the doubled ones, the doubled ones may not move quite as fast, but really you only need one of them to queen, right? And the bee pawns act as a nice shield, whereas his pawns don't shield his king as well, in my opinion. So in any case, um, I, that's why I felt I had the advantage here, and I saw that after rook takes h4, he'd have to go passive. So he finds king h6, which is very clever. So now was a very tricky point. Um, I can't take on f7 with the f rook because he plays rook e1, which will end up in mate. That would be very unpleasant. And rook f takes f7 is certainly a natural move. If I play a4, he plays f5, which is very annoying. Then his f pawn runs quick, his king takes the h pawn, or his rook. And I just did not want to allow him to advance his pawns so fast. I figured that was how, you know, he puts a rook behind the f pawn and runs it, runs the rook down. I could be in trouble. Uh, keep in mind, these endings are very delicate. You know, you can end up losing them as easily as winning, even if you're better. So you have to be very accurate. So I didn't want to allow that. So I had to take f7, but I couldn't do it with the f rook. So I do it with the d rook. So this has a nice bonus. It still puts pressure on this, so he can't, like, run his king up so easily. He can't play g5 so easily, so his king's sort of stuck. Whereas mine has a potential to move after a4 and the king moves up. It also still attacks the a-pawn, and in some lines, the rook can come back and maybe defend. So he played a5, and this is one of the hardest moves I played in the game. I think I spent half an hour on this move, even. And it w turned out to be a really good move. Um, this was one that he totally missed. Like, he didn't even understand it, sort of, when I played it. Um, and to be honest, like, I didn't necessarily see all the subtleties myself. But basically, if I play my rook back now, I have to deal with takes, takes, and g5. This looks sort of idiotic at first. Uh, he's going to end up with, I'm going to end up with three pawns, he's going to have one, you know. But after this, which is pretty much forced, and rook a4, I have to deal with, um, he plays rook c5, and my rook position's really awful. So I play b4, I have to get out of this. Takes, rook takes, h5, and his h a pawn now, usually, connected passers win against one passer, because the rook can sack for the passer, and the connecteds can beat the rook. Here, however, this h-pawn is way too fast, and my rook is positioned badly. So, for example, if I try to go behind, check here, he can play rook h5 in a lot of lines, which is very, very annoying. So this would probably end up in a draw, in my opinion. I didn't think I was losing that. Like, it's very rare to, that you lose these. Like, you usually a way to keep checking with the rook, especially with an h-pawn. But I didn't think I'd be able to win that because my rook position was very bad. So that would be what I'd like to do. Um, however, he certainly needs to take my h-pawn, which is also not cool. I was thinking of rook a, f rook a7, but then he plays rook c5, and I can't move this rook because I'm mate. Um, and also, he can even take the h-pawn now, because I can't move my rook. And then next, he's going to play maybe king, you know, g maybe g5, maybe king up, maybe rook c5 anyway. So in this position, I played a4. So at first, this move looks sort of idiotic. Okay, I'm giving myself two backward b-pawns, so he's going to have connected passers, and I'm not going to have anything. It's not that simple, though. It gives my king shelter. So now I can afford to maybe move my right rook. I still have to be careful I don't get mated by two rooks here, but usually I can at least play b4 to get out of the mating net. Also, now his pawn on a5 is totally, you know, it really has to be defended. Uh, b4 breaks are very common. And now I'm very flexible. I can still play my rook back if he allows it. And now it might be more favorable for me in some situations because I'm a tempo ahead in the races because of a4. And also, I can still go behind. So it's flexible, gives my king shelter, and it's a, you know, it's a pawn move towards the finish, which a good amount of your move should be in these situations. You know, you can't just move. It's tempting to move your rooks to threaten stuff all the time, but you can't always do that. Sometimes, you know, you've got to move a pawn towards the finish line, right? Because getting a queen is probably how you're going to end up winning. So I can, the, another advantage for me here was that I could play a move like this. He can't move his pawns. So after a4... He takes an h4, which is pretty forced. I play rook a7, 
If he plays rook c5, again, pretty forced. If he allows me to take, the three pawns should beat his two. Because, I again, the more shelter is going to decide. Rook to f f7. So now, if he tried to check me and play rook c1, I could take on h7 and take his h rook. This should win very easily. So he can't go for mate. Always what you got to look at. Um, and there's not a whole lot else useful he can do. I'm threatening rook takes h7. So he played rook b4, which I think is an error. I think he has to play king g5, rook h7, rook h7, rook h7, and then king f4. And this is going to be pretty complicated. Uh, what I'm going to have to do is run my king up, play b4, take, run my a pawn up, and try to do something there. Um, he's going to try to run his g pawn as fast as possible. So it's really going to be a race now. How, however, I thought that I'd have reasonable winning chances here. And in analysis, it proved I did. Rook f7 check, I think, was the good first move. The idea being that now the rook blocks, and rook comes here, and now his rook's not actually that well placed. So he plays g5, king a2, g4, and now I can actually play b4. This was an advantage. If his rook's on c5, he plays rook c4 now, which is very annoying. So let's say g3. And now I play, or no, sorry, he has to take on b4. I play king b3, g3. My rook comes around now. So probably g2, rook back, king g3. So I got to play rook g1 now. But his king's sort of out of play. And the rook f1, rook g2, king g2, king b4. Actually, he's really good in this race. <laughs> Uh, this room was a little bit misplayed. Um, I was sort of giving you a sample line. And here, actually, black's probably good. His king gets black too fast. Uh, so that's sort of a line which is not good. Um, i trying to think what the actual, the best way to play this. I think, let's see. All right, I think it was, oh, yeah, ki rook check and just rook over first. So now after g5 king a2, g4, king a3, g3, the rook comes back here right away. And you gain several tempi. So if to g2, for example, b4, take, king takes, king g3, yeah, this is much better. So now rook g1, king f2, take, take, a5. And here, it's certainly a bit closer. So king f3 would be the move. a6, king e4, a7, rook back, king c5 to keep the king at bay, rook here, king b6, king d5. Still a draw. However, it was certainly a bit closer this time. So again, like these are the lines you look at during a game. Now, I'm not saying like this position was just win or draw, but it's certainly, you know, you have to, like, you look at all these lines and, you know, you pick w what gives you the best winning chances. So as you can see, like, black's been drawing in most of these lines. Uh, however, there were some lines we looked at in the postmortem with slight improvements where white was actually winning. So it's hard to determine what the exact evaluation here is. But this was definitely his best shot. He asked to forget about the connected passers, try to do something with g pawn. What he did was he tried to keep both rooks on the board. But what he didn't realize was that the two rooks give me better chances because my b pawns shield him from, my, from his rooks. So what he tried to do was hold on to his a pawn as long as possible and prevent me from playing b4. But with his king so wide out in the open, it's impossible for him to really do anything. So he played rook b4, which is a serious mistake. Now I'm pretty sure I should be winning for white. So I take on h7. He plays king g5. King a2, defending my pawn. Uh, he was hoping that I'd try this. Takes b3 and rook here, trying to win his pawn. So now I have no losing chances. But winning this is going to be tricky after he plays king f4. I take it probably king over. Once his king gets over, it's although his, my king is better than his still, it, winning this is very tricky. So I didn't want to allow him to take it. So the double b pawns matter, and you'll see that double b pawns end up deciding the game for me. So I play king a2. He plays king g4. If you played king f4, um, I can always throw in this check, and he has to play king g4 anyway. So 
wouldn't have been much of an improvement. So I play rook hb7. I have to try to get a pass pawn somehow. Rook f4. So I'm threatening not only rook b4, but rook a5, which is sort of a net little nasty little threat. So you played rook f4. I play rook b5. So this looks at first kind of weird. After rook b5, a b5, I have these tripled pawns. And he has one, but his might be farther advanced. So maybe not like right away, because I have the B pawn. But his pawn could be supported. Mine are going to have trouble. However, you'll see how, because of the tripled pawns, the game is now pretty much decided. So he plays rook f5. And now I played b4. So if he takes on b5, I get the connected passes again, which should win pretty easily this time. For example, rook b5, a b5, g5, king a3, king f3, b4, g4, probably just rook behind the pawn, g3, a6, g2, a7. He can't even stop my pawn yet. So <laughs> the connected passages here kill the play. Um, so uh, so after, so I play b4. So the idea now is if he plays a4, which it, then I can play king up, and I'm going to be several times ahead. Even though he can take my front b-pawn, I take the pawn and play my b-pawn up right away. So this would help me quite a bit. I can also play rook a5 and then b6. Um, but my idea was after takes b4, and I calculated all this, b6, b3 check, which is what he played in sort of desperation. The idea was, now if he plays rook b5, I have b7, and I'm simply going to force his rook away. So he's not going to be anywhere near in time. Even if he throws in b3 check, it doesn't really matter. His rook doesn't have enough squares. So like b3 check, king a3, g5, king a4, rook b6, king a5. And his rook doesn't have any squares. He has to sack, which wins easily for me. So he has to play his rook back to f8. But now, after b7, or sorry, he put through in this b3 check, but it doesn't much matter, as long as I don't take. If I take, he plays here and wins the front b pawn. Can't have that. So I play king a3. Now he has to play his rook back. b7, rook b8, king b3. And now he's just simply losing. Um, if he, he played king f3. If he tries to go back, my king beats him. King e6, king c5, king d7, king b6. And I play rook a8. Over. What he played was king f3. Now, if I just had the one b7 pawn, this would be an easy draw. However, the doubled b-pawns here, although they look rather stupid, actually save me. Or, not save me, but allow me to win. So, king c4, g5, king c5, g4, king c6, g3, king c7, g2, rook goes back, and he resigned. Because, after he moves his rook, I queen, he has to take it. He goes to get a queen himself, and I simply push my b-pawn, sack my rook for his g-pawn, game's over. So, you see, you see how um, sometimes these rook endings from, even from, you know, openings where the endings are usually good for black, could actually favor you. So anyway, a very interesting ending, and an example how even after CB3, which you think good for the attack, bad for the ending, the double pawns actually are pretty good in the ending sometimes. So it's sort of an interesting fact. And um, that was true with, I ended up, because of my mistake, I ended up in only a very slightly better ending, which I had to convert. Um, if he had played the more challenging line, um, as you see, like most of the obvious lines end up being draws. Uh, it was only very sophisticated, which is now lost analysis, <laughs> uh, as it was mostly, you know, post-mortem, uh, allowed white, you know, s with some subtleties to maybe get winning chances. So anyway, um, so there's sort of a nice mixed plate for you, some Yugoslav attack and some rook ending. So uh, I hope you enjoyed it um, and learned some of both. Uh, however, please try to mate instead of winning rook innings if you can avoid it. I, you know, it's what the use loves for. So anyway, uh, thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoy this lecture.